Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers for February 23rd, 2011, the 18th legislative day of the 2011 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Scott Slade and coming up on tonight's program, legislation that changes hope tuition payments gets a hearing in the House Appropriations Subcommittee. Supporters say the bill will save hope for future generations. The bill the House passes a bill establishing a commission to look into funding formulas for K-12 education. We continue our leadership interview series tonight, Senate Majority Leader Chip Rogers. And we'll be going in-depth on the illegal immigration legislation with Representative Matt Ramsey and Sen Senator Nan Orrick. All that is coming up tonight on Primetime Lawmakers. But up first, the governor's Enduring Hope legislation gets its first hearing one day after it's unveiled. And Iwandi Lawson is live at the Capitol with that story. Good evening, Iwandi. Well, good evening, Scott. A House Higher Education Subcommittee this afternoon heard testimony about the plan to offer full college tuition only to the top 10% of Georgia's students. Representative Doug Collins explained how the Hope Scholarship is to be tied to lottery revenues. They looked at the, the, the numbers, they looked at the tuition and said on, based on this year's factor, the factor rate is 90%, that we'll pay 90% of the Hope Scholarship Award. In going ahead, as we look ahead to the future, that's what the whole process will be looked at and the 90%, if the lottery funds are continuing, you know, maybe let's just say, go, let's all look positively here, they go up, then 90% could be kept. Okay, but if there is a with other issues that affect that rate, it may be, you know, a 0.85, it may be 85%, it may be other. So that's where they're looking at it in a combination of the revenues, the enrollments, and, you know, based on a, the per hour factor of uh, the tuition at the various schools. The Georgia Tech student government president suggested that abruptly cutting or reducing financial ties with current HOPE recipients this fall would be disruptive. According to every report that I have read, the proposed changes will take place this fall without any stipulation of a grandfather clause or a transition period for those seniors who cannot afford to account for the reductions in the HOPE scholarship program. The average Georgia Tech student and at the University of Georgia pays about $800 per semester in fees, couple that with $800 in books, plus the proposed decreases, uh, and students would have to account for nearly $2,000 per semester. $4,000 a year. Governor Nathan Deal told reporters yesterday that students won't be the only group experiencing the cuts. The bill includes limits on the bonuses earned by lottery personnel. There is a provision in the bill that will say that bonuses shall not exceed 25% of their base salary. And that will, bonuses will be based on the net revenue to the educational fund, not the overall gross revenue uh, of the lottery itself. One group speaking out today about the hit it would take, retailers who say that limiting their commissions to 5% of gross sales is a slap in the face. This is the reward for retailers who now have the, the third rated lottery in the United States. Now, tell me about that. Tell me that we are not an integral part of the success of the lottery. Tell me that we're not an integral part of the marketing for the lottery. You didn't get to $345 per capita in Georgia without a motivated retailer force. The Full House Appropriations Committee is expected to consider HB 236 tomorrow morning. Approval today in the House for a commission to study ways to revamp the funding formula for the state's K-12 schools. House Education Chair Brooks Coleman was asked about the cost to maintain a 27-member commission to study public education, from teacher pay to transportation. The people who work with the different, like the school board superintendent, he'll pay for his or come out, release time for him. Teachers will be released in their school system. Uh, the legislators that serve will be reimbursed as they normally are for release days. Uh, there, uh, so they'll, and if you look at the last line on 82, it said all other funds necessary to carry out provision of this part will come from funds appropriated by the House of Representatives and the Senate. Also, the Gates Foundation, they've come on board to help us out, private funds to help fund a lot of the cost. House Bill 192 passed by a vote of 160 to 3. It moves to the Senate. The House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee today gave its approval to the governor's initiative to revise the state's corrections system. 
The committee heard no testimony today before it voted to approve House Bill 265, creating a 17-member joint committee on justice reform. The Judiciary Non-Civil Committee amended that bill to require that the findings be submitted by November of this year to ensure that there's adequate time to draft legislation for the next session. That measure now goes before the House Rules Committee. The Senate agreed today that Georgia should create an electronic medical record system to keep track of controlled substances being prescribed. Senator Buddy Carter, who is also a pharmacist, told his colleagues that 30 percent of drug abusers are using prescription medication. I had a customer come in and she presented me with three prescriptions from that doctor. One of them was for OxyContin. OxyContin 15 milligrams, number 30. The other one was for OxyContin, 40 milligrams, 150. The other one was for Xanax, 0.5 milligrams, number 30. I went out there and I asked her, I said, can I see some ID? She presented me with a Kentucky driver's license. Now, I'm in Savannah, Georgia, in Pooler, Georgia. She presents me with a Kentucky driver's license. And I said, well, are you moving here? Are you traveling or what? She said, no, I just came to see this doctor because I heard he was down here. That's the kind of problem pharmacists are faced with every day. SB 36 passed 49 to 6 and heads to the House. Movement in the House today of a measure aimed at banning hallucinogenic bath salts. Representative Jay Neal acknowledges that Georgia does not currently have a widespread problem with the substances, but other states do. Mark Ryan, with the director, uh, who's the director of Louisiana Poison Center, uh, said if you take the very worst of some of the other drugs, LSD and ecstasy with their hallucinogenic delusional type properties, PCP with extreme agitation, superhuman strength and combativeness, as well as the stimulant properties of cocaine and meth, if you take the worst of all of these and put them all together, this is what you get. I mean, there's a bigger problem in some of the other states at this point, but it's becoming more of a problem in Georgia. Uh, I think that if we can get out in front and uh, get this off the, sh the shelves of convenience stores and gas stations before it becomes that kind of a problem in Georgia, then we've, we've done a, a good thing for the state. The House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee gave a due pass recommendation to HB 199, moving that to House rules. In other news, Senator Gloria Butler brought an anti-celebratory gunfire measure approved in DeKalb County before the full Senate today. She says that Senate Resolution 1 honors a four-year-old boy killed by a stray bullet. Markel Peters, at the stroke of midnight, in church with his mother, so excited about going to church. But the next time Markel went to church, it was for his funeral. SR1 passed without opposition. It urges state and local governments to educate the public about the dangers of celebratory gunfire. Well, a Facebook group calling itself Georgians for Sunday alcohol sales rallied at the Capitol this afternoon in favor of Senate Bill 10 and House Bill 69. Senator John Bullock joined other legislators who support allowing local voters to approve retail liquor sales on Sunday. What the issue here is, is about democracy. It's letting the people make the decision that they want for their community. It doesn't matter if you're from Gwinnett County or Grady County, from Atlanta or Albany or O'Clockney. O'Clockney's dry. You can't buy a beer Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday in O'Clockney. And they're not going to change that. But that's their right. So when I introduced SB 10, it's not about the sale of alcohol on Sunday. It's about the people having that right. Shauna Steinfeld sees the prohibition on Sunday sales as an affront to her Jewish faith. The Jewish Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday night. It begins with prayers over wine, bread, and lit candles. The Sabbath ends with prayers over wine, spices, and a lit candle when there are only three stars in the sky on a Saturday evening. Observant Jews spend their Sabbaths at synagogue. Sundays are for Sunday school, then for shopping. But wait, I must remember that for any liquor I need for dinner or for a recipe or for a party, I must buy it on a different day of the week. It is discriminatory and it's the establishment of a state religion. It's wrong and it's offensive. It is no different than the imam requiring the practice of Sharia law. It's not dead, 
Uh, we intend to move it if we can, but you need to really talk to the senators. Uh, it's going to be futility if we don't uh, get an agreement from the Senate to get it through to let the governor sign the bill. And finally tonight, two opposing rallies close out the day at the Capitol. We are the union. We are the union. Mighty, mighty union. Mighty, mighty union. Supporters of the Tea Party movement hold a counter rally opposite labor union members gathered in front of the Capitol in support of public workers at the center of a controversy in Wisconsin. Tea Party supporters say the workers groups are trying to intimidate elected officials. Earlier, Republicans in the Senate announced the introduction of their own resolution of solidarity with other Republican lawmakers who oppose collective bargaining in public contracts. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm in Wandy Lawson for Primetime Lawmakers. I was curious about those opposing rallies today in Wandy. You had the, the union, public union supporters on one side, Tea Party supporters on the other side. Uh, any scuffles? Oh, you know, it's uh, I guess it's America here, Scott. Good news is that rallies on opposite corners there, aside from a few glares across the street at each other, everyone was pretty peaceful. Everyone gets heard. Thanks, Amandi. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. In tonight's leadership segment, Amandi Lawson talks to Senate Majority Leader Chip Rogers about a bill he calls the Taxpayer Protection Amendment. Senator Rogers says Senate Resolution 20 will rein in state spending. Through the years in Georgia, the way the normal budget process goes is that uh, we, we create a budget and then the next year we determine if too much money came in or, or more money, excess revenue, or less revenue came in. Now historically, it had been excess revenue. Uh, here in the last few years, it's, it's been less revenue, but historically it's been excess revenue. And the normal budget process would have said, okay, more money came in, let's spend it. Well, what SR20 says is no, let's not spend it. Let's, let's take that excess money, let's put it into the reserve fund. And then if the reserve fund is filled up to 15%, which we've never reached 15% in this state, but if it ever got to 15%, then we would begin reducing the, uh, the state income tax rate. So the, the, the bill, the actual language of the bill says that the budget from one year to the next cannot increase by more than population plus inflation. So historically, that's about a 5 to 6% increase. And that if any revenue comes in beyond that, it must go into the reserve fund first and then back to the taxpayers. So it's just really good budgeting practice. If we had done that, it would have leveled out our spending through the years. It would have put more money into the reserve fund. So then when we have downturns like, like we have now, we would have that money in the reserve fund instead of having to make some drastic cuts like we're doing uh, in the last three years. Going to the meetings of the tax council and hearing kind of right. what that, what kind of legislation do we expect to come <laughs> out of that? And what will, you know, what can the public expect from that? I think something will come out. I, I don't know what. Uh, there are some excellent recommendations made by the tax council, and there are some others that give people concern. So uh, what we've seen over the last couple of years really is that the income-based model uh, that the state currently has, where, where we have a very high income tax rate, has really caused there to be pretty significant fluctuations in the, in the revenue that's coming into the state government. A consumption-based model actually flattens that out. But more importantly, I think it gives people uh, economic freedom. And that's something I've been talking about for a long time. And, you know, with a consumption-based model, you, the consumer, chooses whether to go buy a, a product or good, and at that point, you choose, in the process of doing that, to pay the tax. And the beautiful thought about, part about the consumption tax is once you pay that tax, your obligation is finished. Um, your, your interrelationship with the government on that particular tax is done with. You don't have to worry about keeping up with receipts and those type things. So if we can move towards a consumption-based model, it's more efficient, it's more easily understood. The average taxpayer fully understands what a sales tax means. Uh, it's more evenly distributed across the entire economy. So um, I, I think it's a good move to move in that direction. And of course, there's concerns always when you talk about the consumption taxes, where it will hit those with very low incomes. I know that there was talk about the possibility of the grocery tax returning and that there would be some sort of a tax refund. Right. Some have come and, and said that, well, for families who are not making very much income, that replacing that money at the end of the year or after the tax time right. is not going to be adequate. Well. I mean, you can make a credible case that that, that, that is one of the policy decisions in this whole uh, proposal that really needs to be examined well. But if we're moving towards a, an overall policy that's more pro-growth, I mean, I think if you look around the state of Georgia right now, the biggest concern we have is jobs. Where are the jobs? How can we get more jobs? And, you know, when you have full employment, um, it tends to solve a lot of problems. So if we can move to a more pro-growth tax policy, I think a lot of those concerns concerns kind of melt away. So the issue you say that you've been wanting to get that out there on the table is school choice. I know you came out early in the session talking about some legislation in that regard. What, what's the status of those bills? 
Well, I think we need to change the way people look at this whole issue of funding. Uh, what we're funding are children. We're not funding schools. We're not funding systems. We're not funding buses. We're funding children. And when, and when, when we as a society or as a state can all agree that, that we're, what we're here to do is fund children to get the best education possible, um, then we can agree that the money ought to follow the child and, and the child ought to be able to choose to go to the best place that works best for that child. I, I mean, I totally reject this idea that some children can't learn. Uh, I am convinced that every single child can learn if given the opportunity and put in the right environment. Um, that your typical brick and mortar school, 25, 30 kids in a class, may not work for every child. And for those children that will work and can, can excel in a different setting, uh, if we can find that setting and it costs the same or even less, uh, we ought to let the child choose that setting. And so um, I, I think really giving children more opportunities is, is fairly common sense. It's how we get there. Uh, but the first step in getting there is recognizing what we're funding are children, not schools or not systems. Now we've heard from Democrats that they want to legislate to end the tax credits that are going to scholarships for private schools, saying that that's actually pulling money out of the public school system. And I'm wondering, how do you respond to that? Well, that's just ridiculous. Uh, the simple mathematics show that, that not only is that not the case, it's the exact opposite. So I would love to sit down with them on a piece of paper and in about five minutes we can show the, the mathematics that, that prove this. And, um, it's really important because what that tax scholarship has done is allowed students to begin the opportunity to again go to the educational setting that works best for them and to do so at an incredibly lower cost than what we were spending on them already. Right now in Georgia it's anywhere between nine and nine, $9,500 to educate a child in your typical brick and mortar public school. That's state funding and local funding combined. Um, if you look at the number one scholarship inside that program, it's the Gold Scholarship. They have a, a, a lion's share of all the students. Their average scholarship is $3,800. So if we were spending $9,500 on a student, and now we're only spending $3,800 on a student, that is an incredible savings. But what's even more important is now the student gets to choose the best educational setting that works best for them. So again, saving money while at the same time providing children with more choice is exactly what we ought to be doing. And, and their problem, where I think they're getting confused, is they're looking at funding the system. And again, it's not about the system, it's about the child. So if for each student we're funding, we're spending less, yet we're giving them more choices, that's exactly what we ought to be doing. So we ought to be expanding that program. Uh, that, that cap ought to be completely removed. And, and for children who want to take advantage of, of choice and we can do so at a lower cost, that's gonna help everybody. And remember that the local tax dollars that are generated, th th these are only state tax dollars, the local tax dollars that are generated at the local level remain in that system while the child has left the system. So it actually saves even more money or gives even more money on a per pupil basis to the children remaining in that system. Again, mathematically their argument just doesn't hold. Uh, it's fairly simple to prove that this program has saved probably tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars while at the same time giving children more choice. And those are the type of things we need to be looking at. Senator Chip Rogers is the majority leader in the Senate. Thanks so much for joining us on Primetime Lawmakers. You bet, thanks for having me. Coming up tomorrow in our leadership series, newly elected insurance commissioner Ralph Hudgens uh, will join us and we'll talk to him about going after the fraudsters and bringing in more competition to Georgia. After this short break, we'll be talking about the latest on immigration reform legislation. Representative Matt Ramsey and Senator Nan Oryk, so stay with us. Watch GPB Sports Central with me, Gil Tyree. I'm Mark Harmon. I'm Nikki Noto. And I'm John. GPB Sports. Sorry. Nikki Noto. And I'm John. GPB Sports. Shoot. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Too soon. I'm Nikki Noto. GPB Sports Central. My bad. And I'm John. GPB Sports. Uh, so close. Not even close. Seemed close. And I'm John. No GPB Sports Central, the leader in high school sports. Next time on Pioneers of Television. Do you think we could squeeze out the I think he's a nut. You just don't understand. But you get a jolt from the audience when they laugh at you. And it just gives you that mm, to go do the next part even better. Now go. <laughs> Tonight at 8 on GPB. 
Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. Immigration reform legislation has been a hot button issue this session. Just yesterday, a rally opposing many illegal immigration bills was held at the Capitol. There are currently several bills in both chambers addressing the issue. On the House side, HB 59, a bill limiting attendance to in-state colleges and universities to only those who have legal status, has passed its committee and is awaiting action by the full House. Also, HB 87, known as the Illegal Immigration Reform and Enforcement Act, which imposes harsh penalties on those who, quote, harbor illegal aliens, to use the language of the bill. It also allows law enforcement officers to ask for proof of identity during the course of an investigation from people they think may be illegal immigrants. It requires private employers who have at least five employees to participate in the federal E-Verify program. That bill is currently in committee. Representative Matt Ramsey of Peachtree City is a sponsor of both those bills. He is with us live in studio this evening as well as Senator Nan Oreck of Atlanta. Also joining us this evening, Senator Oreck is an advocate for working families and opposes these immigration reform measures. Thank you both for being here. It's great to be able to, to talk about this issue. Certainly, anytime you bring it up, people have plenty to say. And Well, I guess one of the first things I'd like to ask of both of you is, what's the urgency for immigration reform, and is it the state's business? Representative Ramsey, why don't we start with you? I absolutely believe it's the state business. When I keep hearing people say this is exclusively a federal issue, I think it is about the most patently absurd state statement I've ever seen, when you consider our state and local taxpayers are bearing to the tune of $2.4 billion a year the cost of subsidizing the presence of 425,000 illegal aliens in our state. It burdens our schools, it burdens our transportation infrastructure, it burdens our law enforcement community, it burdens uh, every service that we provide through our state and local taxpayers. So absolutely, this is an issue that we need to deal, a state deal with as state policy. So you think the urgency is in the, the burden that it places on state services? I, I think that certainly is one of the compelling reasons that we have to do it. I, uh, every, just about everything we're doing in this day and time is, is, is budget driven. Resources are more scarce, classrooms are larger. We would absolutely be abdicating our responsibility as policymakers if we didn't, uh, if we didn't attempt to address this issue in a meaningful way this year. Senator Ark, what do you think? Is this urgent and is it the state's business? We have a crisis nationally on immigration policy. Uh, it's a broken system. Right now there's a waiting list of 15 years for a person from Mexico to become naturalized. Uh, we have uh, people that are here without documentation all across the country living in the shadows. Uh, we have a broken system and it needs addressing on the federal level. And, and frankly, the best thing we could do as state policymakers is get together with our governor and get together with our congressional de delegation, send a message to Congress, to Washington, that they need to undertake comprehensive immigration reform. We heard the other night from a, a owner of a large poultry plant up in Gainesville where we had a hearing. And he said, please don't try any more laws here. I'm losing my workforce. I'm losing money. Uh, we cannot have 50 policies in 50 states. Uh, get Washington to address the problem comprehensively. That's what's needed. Were you at that meeting in, in Gainesville, the Georgia Mountain Center, the one you just mentioned? Uh, I, I was not there. I had four or five colleagues from the Senate who I uh, spoke with today. Uh, I was curious because the, the tenor of that crowd, made one exception, was this, immigra this for immigration reform in this form will be an economic disaster. That's right. And I think that that's the case, and I think we're already seeing it in Arizona. We don't need an Arizona copycat law. I've talked to members of the uh, corporate international community, inter international uh, corporations who do business abroad, and they say everywhere they go, they hear about the Arizona law and how unseemly it's seen by other nations. We are, uh, a, 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 have achieved an international status. We have a very diverse uh, racial mix in our, in our state, and that mix is part of what's healthy and what is, opens the doors for international investment. Our economic uh, development folks, the experts in the economic development, say to get Georgia's economy on the right track, we need to be courting and winning uh, support and investment and trade internationally. We hamper ourselves when we pass these kinds of laws. Representative Ramsey, more on that, the economic impact, you know, beyond uh, the burden on schools and hospitals, the reverse impact of that, do you buy that? Well, I absolutely, absolutely do not. You strip away all that rhetoric from my, my, my colleague in the Senate, and, and you get right down to, to the bottom of it. And what she's suggesting is that we as a state cannot prosper economically without relying on those that circumvented our nation's laws to come here. I will never agree with any, any, any proposition that Georgia can't prosper without those that are here in our country illegally. 
course, we're hearing from the business community. Uh, the Georgia Farm Bureau has an extensive statement. They are keenly aware of how significant the immigrant workforce in Georgia is for agriculture. That's a $65 billion industry, and they feel it's very threatened if we continue forward with an Arizona copycat law. They've put it in writing. Uh, it's available on their website. You hear from uh, people in the uh, tourism industry. That's a $35 billion industry in Georgia, and they are begging and pleading. The Restaurant Association, all the sectors of the economy where the immigrant workforce is a vital part of our workforce and is here and is helping this state prosper economically. That's the road that we need to look at, not threatening uh, and I, I think, our I think, I, I think what Senator Orrock and the, the ACLU and the other groups that are out marching and beating the band against this bill, you just heard from her a distinction that they're trying to blur. She used the word immigrant to refer to what we're doing. Over a million people a year immigrate legally to the United States. This is not an anti-immigrant bill. This in no way impacts in any way the ability to come, somebody that is in our country legally to come here to Georgia. What this bill does is get at the social and economic consequence. And we do believe, uh, agree on one point, that, that our immigration system nationally is broken. Our federal right. government has That's absolutely right. failed in their fundamental responsibility to secure our borders. What we don't agree on is whether or not I'm willing, a, as a state policymaker, to throw my hands up and wait for the federal government to act while my constituents are, are footing the bill for that Well, failure. I introduced a resolution, and I would love to see it passed in the Senate and the House. It got to the Rules Committee, and it calls on us as state leaders to call on Congress to address immigration. Well, uh, 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 I mean, this, this thing of state by state, 50 states, just simply makes no back, sense. Back to federal control, because the, the mm -hmm. feds do run the borders, okay, it's their job. Exactly. Uh, HB 87, the, the <laughs> bill you're co-sponsoring, is, is that going to be federal lawsuit proof? Uh, absolutely. We have, been, we have been consulting with the best legal minds in the state. We've worked with the Attorney General's office. No matter what we pass, I'm sure the ACLU is going to bring a lawsuit. We are 100 percent confident that it complies with, with, with the U.S. and Georgia Constitution. It is absolutely the very best effort that we can put forward as state policymakers to remove every single incentive that we can for those that are illegally in this country from coming to Georgia. What about the E-Verify provision in, in, this, in this law? Now, we're talking about private companies with five or more employees who'd be subjected to this. Are you stepping up some toes here? Well, E-Verify e is far and away the best tool that we have avail available to us to get at the root cause of illegal immigration. That's illegal employment. If we pass a bill to, to, to deal with uh, the presence of illegal aliens and don't get at private employment, it's like trying to cure cancer with, uh, with aspirin. It's just not effective unless you get at the root cause, which is, which is, uh, which is illegal employment. E-Verify, we know, is a, a simple easy. I've enrolled my, my, my business in E-Verify. It adds about 30 seconds to the hiring pro uh, process and it is far and away the best tool we have available to ensure our state has a legal workforce. Do you think that's fair, Senator? I have heard uh, serious questions and grave concerns raised about E-Verify. And uh, in Cobb County, uh, in recent times, the finance minister of Spain was stopped on a traffic question, showed his Spanish driver's license, and wound up in jail in Cobb County. Needless to say, Spain's not placing a local, a consul here in uh, our state after treatment like that. Those are the kinds of egregious things that happen in the wake of these laws. We need to fix, to fully fund, secure our borders, create a national immigration system that gives a pathway to citizenship for those that are here illegally. And quite frankly, that's the approach that is sound and Senator Ramsey continues to bring up the ACLU. You just promoted uh, me, Representative Ramsey. Uh, uh, I well, wouldn't care, consider well, you know that. What? I wouldn't consider that a promotion. Okay, Scott. Okay. But, <laughs> smaller too. Uh, but but uh, but uh, the the business community of our state is deeply concerned. We'll have to wrap it right there. Have you both contacted the Georgia congressional delegation? To lobby them I, I, on this. I have had numerous discussions with my congressman and others. I, I can assure you the folks that I'm talking to uh, uh, have heard our concerns. They're well aware of them and support. Same to you, Senator. I have introduced resolutions and spoken with Congress members of Congress as recently as today. We're going to have to leave it there. Issue. We're going to get you back so to you on this. Thank you so much for both coming in and talking appreciate about it. this. Thank you, we Scott. appreciate it. Coming up tomorrow on Primetime Lawmakers, the Senate is expected to take up the FY 2011 amended budget as well as the Taxpayer Protection Amendment you heard about in our leadership segment. Uh, speaking of leadership, 
Leadership. We'll have State Insurance Commissioner Ralph Hudgens on the program, plus in-depth analysis on legislative issues and the latest Capitol News tomorrow night at 7. You can see a repeat of this broadcast tomorrow morning at 5.30 on GPB. Coming up next, join Gil, Mark, John, and Nikki for the best high school sports show, bar none. GPB Sports Central is next. And that's our broadcast for the 18th Legislative Day of the 2011 session. Thanks to our guests for joining us tonight. For Wandy Lawson and the Primetime Lawmakers team, I'm Scott Slate. Hope you have a great night. This is a GPB original production.